Good evening. Uh, this is Barbara Slavin. It's June 26. I'm at the Morse Institute Library. I'm interviewing Edward Carr in our Veterans Oral History Project. Um, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you um, for having me. Thank you. Now, your name is uh, Ed Carr, C-A-R-R, -R, for the right. record. And your address? In the attic. Okay. Your age? I'm 52. And your marital status? I am happily married with three children. Yeah. You don't have any grandchildren, do you? I do not. Okay. Don't look, don't look old enough. Where were you born? I was born in Leonard Morse Hospital in Natick. In, uh, were in, you raised in Natick? I was raised in Natick. Could you tell me what Natick was like when you were growing up? Um, Natick was very much of a uh, um, community oriented town much like it is today except um, uh, the differences uh, I guess you could say were uh, uh, there were a lot more it seems to me anyway um, uh, blue-collar people in those days mm -hmm. than there are these yeah. days um, however uh, I think and, and there seemed to be a lot of different um, the kids were a little bit different in the in the things that they did in those days as opposed to what they do these days. Uh, in other words, so there was more swimming and and pick up baseball games and things like that. Where today the kids, it seems to me anyway, are more organized and structured. You see a lot less kids uh, hanging out. Although some kids do hang out, and uh, um, that's. I guess that's that's the biggest difference I see. Hmm. May I ask you what your family background is? Um, my family background, uh, my my grandfather moved um, from Brighton to South Natick in uh, in the late thirties, um, and he had he had five kids at the time that they moved to Natick. Uh, my father had graduated, just graduated from uh, from Brighton High School, and all the other kids that my grandfather had went through the Natick school system. Uh, my uncle, one of my uncles, was captain of the Natick football team, and uh, my aunts went through, and my other uncle went through school. Um, my my father and mother married. My mother was from from uh, the Watertown area. Uh, Watertown Brighton and they married uh, shortly after my father got back from uh, World War II and then they uh, established roots in Natick from there. When uh, and where did you enter the military? I entered the military in Natick actually at the Marine Corps recruiter in Framingham mm -hmm. in, um, in uh, July of 67. Why did you choose the Marines? Well uh, my thinking at the time was that uh, that they were just the best uh, outfit to be in if you were going to uh, if you were looking for uh, adventure and a chance to uh, participate in combat or you know when you're young and you and you're feeling uh, those feelings that the Marine Corps would uh, undoubtedly give you the best training to survive. That coupled with the fact that uh, most of my friends were joining the Marine Corps uh, solidified it. Did you find that a lot of, uh, that that was particular to Natick, so many people signed Yeah, there was services? an extraordinarily large amount of, of uh, young men that joined the Marine Corps in those, those few years. Um, they really were, and uh, although there were some in the other branches, there were, there were most of them, most of the fellows I knew anyway joined the Marines. Where were you sent for basic training? I went to uh, Paris Island, yeah. uh, South Carolina, and then to Camp Lejeune for uh, advanced infantry training. What was Paris Island training like? It was um, it was difficult in in some ways, but it was easy in other ways. Um, I had already had a year of college, and I had been away from home uh, when I joined. So in, in some regards, um, it was easier to, to be away from home. 
Um, I had had I was an athlete in high school, a football player. So the the physical part of it, although hard, wasn't um, excruciating like it was to uh, some people. Um, so I, I'd say that that um, it was difficult, but it wasn't. You know, um, it, it didn't stand out as as anything that that um, anybody else couldn't do if they set their mind to it. Did you find that you were prepared for cultural differences, that you uh, mixing with different people that you might not have mixed with in Natick when you were in the training? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, having gone to a Catholic school, uh, to Marion High, and um, um, being exposed to sort of a cosmopolitan uh, education that you get there because you meet kids from different towns as opposed to just Natick. Yeah. Um, I was I was braced for the culture shock as, as you're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. However, um, uh, as far as dealing with, with people of other races, no, that was, I had a lot to learn mm -hmm. um, about, uh, about other races and I learned it a lot in the Marine Corps. How was your training at Camp Lejeune? Uh, there again, you know, I didn't. Yeah, I, I don't want to say it was it was no sweat, but it wasn't um, as difficult as as some of the movies make it out to be. I mean, it's you go through the training, and and the Marine Corps is systematically breaks you down and builds you up, and, yeah. and it just doesn't happen in one day. And and they, you know, God love them, know what they're doing. Where were you sent after that? Um, from Camp Lejeune, from ITR, I came home for a 30-day leave, mm -hmm. and then I was uh, I was sent to um, Camp Pendleton for forward observer training um, for artillery forward observer uh, scout school, and I went there for a few months um, to the school, and then I was. Um, supposed to go to Vietnam right after that, but they sent me back to Camp Lejeune to work in an intelligence uh, mm -hmm. with an intelligence group for a while. And while I was there, I um, they were going to send me on a med cruise, um, and and I really didn't want to have anything to do with that. So I volunteered for Vietnam from from Camp Lejeune. And um, after a while, they they got the drift that you know I. That's what I wanted to do, and how could they say no? So they they sent me to um, back to the West Coast, where um, uh, I was in a staging battalion, ready to go to Vietnam, and they um, pulled me out of the staging battalion and uh, sent me to Vietnamese language school. Mm -hmm. So I went to Vietnamese language school at Camp Del Mar, uh, which is was the exclusive Marine Corps. Uh, language school. They have another one, a huge one, in Monterey for the for the rest of the services, and sometimes they send Marines up there as well. But um, I went to the Camp Delmar um, language school, and it was nine weeks of intense um, brainwashing for to teach you the language and the culture, um, uh, and then from there I went uh, over to Vietnam. Just to clarify things, what is a med cruise? A med cruise is what they call the Mediterranean cruise. Oh, it's okay. where they take the, they take a large group and they go and they they play war games in the Mediterranean. And what is a forward observer? A forward observer is a person who um, is out in front of the artillery, and by in front I mean he could be a few miles or okay. um, or less. And what he does is adjust. Um, artillery fire when they when they fire the big howitzers the rounds um, land in a certain place and it's his job to call back to the guns and and give them uh, the direction mm -hmm. you know to to move their fire so they hit the target mm -hmm. um, and, and you uh, Ford observer is trained to do that with naval gun fire and and mortars I mean it's just a it's a way to uh, be the eyes mm -hmm. of the artillery is what they call them. So after Del Mar, it was to Vietnam. Right. And how did you get to Vietnam, by boat or plane? I got there by plane. Yeah. Uh, we stopped in Hawaii and then landed in Da Nang.
How long did they let you stay in Hawaii? Uh, a couple of hours. Uh. They let us off the turn off the plane to stretch our legs and put us back on, and we were gone again. And what was it like when you landed in Da Nang? It was extremely hot. Um, uh, it's like the worst humid day that you experience around here. If it were if it were 108 around here and humid, that's what it was getting off of that plane. Wow. And what did you think was ahead of you when you landed? I hoped uh, water. I just, you know, I mean, it was, uh, uh, I had an unquenchable thirst for a month, I think. I think it was just, uh, as far as the action go, was yeah. it, is that the Everything, question you yeah. meant? No, I didn't know. I just, yeah. you just survive from yeah. minute to minute. Yeah. What were your feelings about the, the war in Vietnam at the time that you landed? I just wanted a drink of water, and that's <laughs> all I was thinking about. I, mean, I wasn't thinking about war. Yeah. I didn't have those thoughts. Of thinking about right. water and something to eat and a place to sleep and those kind of things. You just the good soldier I'll, should think about. Yeah. Well, you just you want to survive. Right. You know? So what what was your next step after that? Once once I landed in uh, Vietnam, they they um, sent me. I landed in in Da Nang at the um, battalion headquarters of the 11th Marines, yeah. and the 11th Marines sent me up to Fubai um, to um, be with the uh, 2nd Battalion 11th Marines, mm -hmm. and from the 2nd Battalion 11th Marines in Fubai, they sent me out to Kilo Company 3rd Battalion 5th Marines. Mm -hmm as the, uh, the brand new forward observer. So within, um, within two or three days, I was in the field with a, an infantry outfit. And could you tell me what that was like? That was scary. Yeah. That was um, only because um, I knew that I didn't know anything. And, and um, we were taking incoming rounds. And I knew I had a lot to learn about surviving, you know, where just surviving. Mm. And I was lucky enough to um, have people help me and, and uh, that's just, that's the way of it. So you, you can say you were in combat in, in Vietnam? Within a week, yeah. Within a week. Right. And what was the nature of the combat aside from being a forward observer? Did you get involved in, uh, did you see your enemy? Did you get involved in hand-to-hand -hand fights? Sometimes, sometimes, yeah. Uh, I never got in hand-to-hand, -hand, right. but I've seen my enemy and, and right. shot at him. Right. Um, the combat is for, um, you know, it, it's difficult to explain um, combat for for one person maybe sitting in, in a bunker with rounds coming in and they know pretty much that, that they're, um, they're safe. Um, and combat in another situation is people shooting bullets at you and you're, and you're exposed. Um, it, was a, it was a myriad of things, but compressed uh, into a year, there was maybe only 20 minutes or an hour, you know, or a half an hour of actual combat, you know, when it's, um, uh, but you take away those minutes and, mm -hmm. and, um, and stretch it out over a year, it's, it's, it's different because of the anticipation. Mm -hmm. So how long were you a forward observer? I, I remained in the field for 10 months. 10 months. Um, I, I went, I was on a number of operations and then after 10 months I, I, uh, I politicized my way out of there and, and got myself a job in, uh, in civic action uh, and intelligence uh, as an interpreter. So in my first 10 months, I, I really didn't get a chance to, um, to hone my skills mm -hmm. as an interpreter, and I was mostly a uh, forward observer. And where were you in Vietnam when you were a forward observer? I was everywhere from, um, not everywhere, but I was from Fubai South, to a place called Anwa, and I was, I went as far uh, west uh, as uh, as the border of uh, Laos, Cambodia, in in that area um, of the mountains. I'm sure we crossed the border a few times, and I was far east as the coast 
Um, you say you cross the border, you cross the border into where? Into uh, either uh, Laos or Cambodia. I'm not sure. They, right. We didn't have maps really with names on them. We right. just had um, <laughs> yeah. maps. Right. Could you tell me w what, um, how you were able to spend your time, your downtime, so to speak, when you were a forward observer? Um, hanging out, you yeah. know, hang out right. um, with the people you're with, and uh, it's funny because the war, uh, the war was conducted primarily at night. Um, a few times during the day, you have you do things, but uh, primarily uh, it was at night. And during the day, you're mostly resting or. You know, trying to stay in the shade, and because it, the heat is just brutal, which is an interesting thing about that country. Um, um, the country is uh, was one of the largest exporters of rice in the world before the war started, and and the culture did most of their uh, their farming at night. Mm. You know, they'd run the dikes and the, and lower the water and. Now, we were conducting the war at night that killed the economy because the people couldn't be out there. And they had to try to uh, eke out a living during the day, and it was just, it was almost impossible. That's, that's why they had the great poverty there. And that's what most of, when Walter Cronkite brought Vietnam into your living room and you saw the, the, the poverty there, it was just, it was incredible because, you know, we were killing it. Uh, um, Vietnam is a very beautiful country with very beautiful people, and and um, uh, in given its own um, um, wherewithal, I mean, it's it's just uh, it's a culture, it's just a thousand-year-old culture, but it's it's just a wonderful place. It's it's beautiful, and it's um, but uh, you know, war is the ultimate social problem. Mm. Did you get, get any official R&R &R during the time you were yes, forward I, observer? Yes, I went twice. Well, once as a forward observer and then uh, once uh, when I was in uh, civic action. And I went to Hong Kong both times. Oh. Now, before you said you politicized your way into your job in civic action. Can right. you tell me how you did that? Well, when I, as I said, when I first went out to be a forward observer and I didn't know anything, uh, I put myself under the wing of a lieutenant and, and other forward observers, scouts and radio operators that, see, we worked as a unit. Mm -hmm. the, the infantry had 80 or so um, members to it, and the forward observer, uh, the FO part of the mm -hmm. team, was usually two guys, sometimes three and occasionally four. Um, Usually a, a lieutenant was supposed to be the, the head of the unit. Then he had a scout sergeant, which would have been me, mm -hmm. and then a radio operator or two, and sometimes two scout sergeants. So that when I hit the group that I hit, I was able to learn my trade so that by the time I was leaving um, in, in 10 months, which is a very long time over there, I was able to um, be the person that was training after four or five months so that young lieutenants would come from, from the United States and be new and come onto my team and they'd have to do what I told them to do in order to survive. They knew enough you know, to, to rely on, on my experience and um, just, just to survive. And, I worked with three or four lieutenants, and the, the thing about the rotation about lieutenants was that they only had to stay out in the field a month or two, where the rest of us had to stay out a year. The enlisted men had to stay out the whole tour. So, you know, I made friends with the lieutenants, and as they were going back to the rear, to the battery, you know, I knew them all, and I had just, you know, I said, look at if there's a job back there, you know, that's, I would like to volunteer because I have this, this, yeah. uh, this skill in, in Vietnamese. So a couple of them took care of me and uh, you know, by, the, by the 10th month I had just, I'd had it. Uh, I was, and I can remember the, I can remember it. I mean, it was, uh, it was uh, Operation uh, Mead River. 
and that's why it just was time for me to go in. Now I forgot to ask you the date that you landed, roughly the date you landed when you in Vietnam. Uh, I landed May the first week in May of sixty eight, okay. and I went home the last week in May in sixty nine. When you uh, so you were there at the beginning of the Tet Offensive, or just after the beginning of the Tet Offensive? Right, I was there at the end of right. Tet and the beginning of a new Tet. Oh, okay. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Um, well, I was new, so there was, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of action. Fortunately, there was a lot of action, and I was with a very experienced group, so I learned very fast about how to stay alive. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there was a lot of action and there were a lot of people uh, right. getting hurt. Now, could you tell me about your, your job as, in, as the interpreter? Um, that was, uh, when I get back out of the field, um, um, my primary job was to uh, build a relationship between the battery, which was uh, 211 or, or the battalion. Um, I was I went to the battalion headquarters and um, to build a relationship between the Vietnamese who were outside of this compound called An Hoa, mm -hmm. and uh, you know to build a laundry and get workers to fill sandbags and mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So I had I had about a hundred Vietnamese working on the base that were my responsibility. Uh, um, you know, doing all kinds of chores for uh, for the Americans who didn't want to work in the heat. Were they civilian employees? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And how yeah. did that go? Well, it was it was great for me because I really, you know, I lived in the village basically, and yeah. and I lived with the people, and I ate with them, and slept with them, yeah. and you know, I became it, the interesting part of it was that, you know, for the first ten months, I was doing whatever I could to kill them, and. The last three months I was doing whatever I could to keep them alive and it was, but I couldn't, I wasn't able to separate for a while in the beginning who they were until I got the chance to really know the people and mm -hmm. and that was a very, that was um, something that that was bothersome for, for many years mm -hmm. and how still do, is. How do, they, how do you think they felt about you? Well, I was, they want to survive just like I did. I mean, it's, it's survival. That's what it's all about. It's not about f like feely stuff that, yeah. that sensitivities that, that this culture, mm -hmm. this culture that the American culture has is not, um, as I see it, the way they did. Um, they're, they're, a very ancient culture that have um, very uh, strict uh, guidelines. I don't know how to explain yeah. it. I can give you an example. It, it um, it's like like an American sees a little kid and they rub the top of their head, and that's kind of a natural thing. But in the in Asia, or particularly in Vietnam, to do that is a, is humiliating to a kid, and it's little things like that that you, that Americans never learned over there, that that um, would would have made the difference. But you know, as I said, it was a learning experience, and and um, and I still have times, you know, where I've in my own mind trying to separate the the will to live with the will to let live, mm -hmm. and. and Sometimes, uh, you know, that's a something I wrestle with still. Do you have any stories of the projects that you got involved with that you directed them in, or the things they built for you? Um, yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, one time, I'd written a letter to um, Marion High about the poverty that that yeah. was over there, and um, uh, the, it was just incredible. How, the, how they were living with nothing and and I sent the letter and a few weeks later I got uh, I got a reply from the high school and and if you can imagine one of these big when well, you see these big dump trucks yeah. going by well picture one of those empty and and then full of supplies 
the whole the high school sent like all those supplies to this one little village. But you know, I, I have pictures of it somewhere at, at home. But um, um, the the unbelievable thing was the way that the people stormed on this truck to take the stuff. I mean, it was just it was like piranha on meat, mm -hmm. and it was. It was unfortunate that, that I hadn't been smart enough to be a little more organized in the distribution of it. You know, I just, oh great, this is a one-shot deal. So it was, a, in a way, a wasted opportunity, but in, in a way it wasn't. I know. What was the name of the village you were in? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It was Anwa was the, there were a number of little right. villages around. Uh, there was like five little hamlets, but Anwa was, was the uh, the main area, and you were in the village as opposed to being in your base. Is that right? Well, there were a number of little like hamlets. Hamlets. Okay. That that it's not the village. Um, villages aren't aren't quite like um, you would normally think a village would be with the village chapel and the village um, apothecary and you know, those kind of things. It wasn't like that. It was. It was really agricultural, rural, so that and when I talk about a village or a house, I mean, we're talking about grass huts. We're not talking about um, anything of any right. substance. I mean, they were just, they were made of grass, basically. And one match and they were gone. You mentioned before when you were a forward observer in your free time you'd hang out. Now, when you had free time in this village, how did you socialize? Did you find other soldiers outside the village, or did you learn to no, really I lived, socialize with the Vietnamese? I socialized with the Vietnamese yeah. mostly, and, and, and it was kind of a chore. It was a business, basically. I mean, I had 100 people to mm -hmm. keep track of during the day, and so I'd be riding, and you know, I'd be staying busy, basically, during the day. We had a laundry, and, and um, it, was, it was busy. It was what kind of food did you eat? Mostly Vietnamese at that time, yeah. you know. I wasn't, um, you know, sometimes sea rations or long rations, but mostly Vietnamese food. Mm -hmm. I had dropped in weight too. I was, uh, I went over there at 205, and by this time I was 145. Wow. So I had dropped a lot of weight, but how, how tall dehydrated, were you? five nine. Five nine. Mm -hmm. Right. So you were thin. I was thin, yeah, yeah, yeah then. Unfortunately, I, when I went on R and R, I had a few suits made at my 145 weight, and when I came home, I went right back up again. So my <laughs> brothers were pleased about that. But, um, were you able to hear when you were in Vietnam about how the war was going on in other parts of Vietnam? Um, when I was out in the field, uh, no. Okay. Um, out in the field, uh, for 10 months, I was fairly isolated as to lots of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Bobby Kennedy was killed. I didn't know about it for a month afterwards. I mean, we go out sometimes for a week. The longest we ever went out with for was six weeks, and and that was that was tough. That was really tough because you know there were times in it where you know, we go three days without food and water, and and that can get um, hard. Um, when I first went out into the bush, I was I carried four canteens of water. And when I, by the time I got out of the bush, I could make one canteen last a week, because you just get dehydrated and you learn how to, you learn how to live. How did, uh, how did your you and your fellow uh, soldiers take it when you heard that uh, Robert Kennedy had been assassinated? Well, you, you know, it's funny. It, I can't speak for, for anyone else. I mean, uh, about friends dying and people dying, death is, is so um, with you all the time, but, and you harden yourself to it. Um, I, uh, I know one of the questions that, that was on your list that, that you gave me before was about friends and, mm -hmm. and, and that. Um, I didn't really make any friends in boot camp because you're, you're too busy to make friends. I made friends in the schools that I went to in both, in both um, uh, the language school and the forward observer school because you have time to socialize. Mm -hmm. You go to the school but you, there's still plenty of time to, to make friends. And I made 
good friends and and um, interestingly enough I lost both of them over there mm. uh, you know one the first week and and then I just you harden yourself to, to making friends you don't want to make any more friends you know just we're here and, and we've got a job to do and and then I lost the, the other one six months into it and they were both uh, interestingly enough in the unit I was in which was kind of a coincidence but you really, and for many years after that, I didn't care to make friends. I, it's it's not that you don't like people. It's just you don't um, you don't want to get attached anymore because right. it hurts. Right. And um, so, to answer your question about Bobby Kennedy, by that time, you know, we, you kind of numb yourself to oh, geez, you know. I, it was nothing. I cried for a week when when JFK died, but I was a sophomore in high school, and and uh, you know a very unmanly thing to do when you're a sophomore is cry and and but you know you, you couldn't help it because he was you know he was probably the reason that that a million men went to Vietnam. I mean he was that moving, and and Robert was too in his own way. But by that time we were all too uh, jaded, I guess. Is the word? Yeah. Did you hear about the anti-war demonstrations uh, in the United States when you were in Vietnam? Oh, absolutely! Yeah. Could you tell me about that? They were a motivator for us. You know, we hated, um, and hate is a motivator. And, yeah. and um, anybody that was doing it was um, especially hated. And I'm still coming to grips with it. Today, I mean, in my mind, uh, Jane Fonda, you know, has not paid the price. You know, she says she's sorry, but she has not paid the price. And, um, you know, I think that's unfortunate. What price would you like to see her pay? I don't know. Yeah. I'm not the judge and jury, but right. I don't think that a simple I'm sorry after the wonderful life she's led, um, you know, that far be it from me to, to impose the penalty but she hasn't um, you know that hate still remains that that I look at I look at pictures of her sometimes on the um, on the uh, anti-aircraft gun and you know they were filming that when McCain was uh, was running and I just and I flashed back to the to the times where do you know how demoralizing that was for the men over there I mean there there were guys dying every day and and you just say Jesus you know if was Jane on the gun that that shot down the the plane that could have killed the guy that killed my friend yeah. you know it was that kind of a thing it was, it was treason without you know most of the I'd say most most of the feeling in Vietnam was that we didn't belong there politically whatever we shouldn't have been there we're going to do our time and go home however your country is your country and and love it or leave it right or wrong and we were wrong and and I really think we were wrong however um, she was more wrong for for doing that yeah. and you know I, I if somebody went to Canada that was fine with me you know and and if somebody protested that was fine with me but that doing that was going overboard. You know, everybody has a right to say we shouldn't belong. We we shouldn't have gone there. And and I don't have, I don't have a um, bad feeling about that towards anyone who did do that. But it's the Jane Fondas that that went overboard that that get my goat still. Yeah. Did you have any um, official USO shows come in? To Vietnam? Yeah, I didn't see any. Uh -huh. I, I heard about them, but I didn't see any. <laughs> and just to get back to the nitty gritty of some things, could you tell us of the clo were the clothes you wore adequate for the climate? The clothes? Um, no, we adjusted on the clothes. You know, nobody wore underwear, and you know, you you um, you wear a t-shirt mostly, and uh, yeah, you adjust. You know, you. It depends on where you were. You know, if you're in the if you're in the, the swamps or something, and you have leeches all over you. You have to tie yourself up in mm. certain ways, and 
cover yourself in other ways. You, you know, you just you know, adapt. And I know you got a big package from Marion Hyde. Did was getting the mail an important part of? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mail was, um, especially if you've been out in the bush for a while. You know, if you've been out for a few weeks or a month or so, it's uh, it's always nice to get mail. Yeah. Really nice to get mail. What kind of radio? When you listen to the radio, what did you hear? I never listened to. You the never radio. listened to the radio. No, okay. we li no because we were in a field. It. it yeah. um, no, we never listen to the radio. How much did you know about the uh, Vietnamese? Well, I went to Vietnamese language school, right. so I was indoctrinated. But I, did you uh, find that they prepared you well enough for what the Vietnamese were like? Me? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Not, not um, going through the infantry training and not going through any of the regular basic Marine Corps training, but going to Vietnamese language school, I had a whole different outlook on it. I mean, I, I got to um, s study them culturally and, as well as learn their language mm -hmm. so that I was well prepared to deal with Vietnamese where, where you know, 99.9% .9 of the, the guys going over there didn't have a clue, actually. You know, they were, they were gooks. You know, they were less than human. So what... What happened next in Vietnam for you? You were working in the village with these people. Well, then I came home right. uh, after that. When was that? That was in 1969. Okay. And could you tell me what your homecoming was like? Or how you came home first? Was it by boat or plane? Um, I came home by plane. Yeah. Um, I landed in California and, and uh, took my time coming home and right. came home. Um, when you landed in California, I almost know the answer to this, but when you landed in California, were there people there to greet you home? No. Yeah. No, um, no. How do you feel about the difference between the way you were treated and the way, way let's say, a World War II veteran was treated when, when he returned home? Well, it was a different, different deal altogether. Yeah. I mean, it was just different. I, I, it was interesting. I, I, my brother-in-law one of my favorite people went to uh, uh, the Gulf War, and he spent his time there almost a year. And when he came home, we we all traipsed out to uh, Peas, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, is it Peas? The what's the Pease? one in Chicopee? I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the Air Force Base out in Chicopee. Anyway, mm -hmm. we all went out there and and welcomed him home, and it was all. You know, family and cheers, and you know, it was it was great. You know, and I really, I thought it was great. Mm. Uh, a few questions I did forget to ask you: Do you feel that your officers gave you good leadership in Vietnam? Um, as I said, I, I had the opportunity to train some officers in the field. Um, my combat experience was. Um, I was lucky enough in the beginning, as I said, to be put with a group of people, and and one of the um, one of your questions that I noticed was, you know, who was your most memorable character, yes. and this seems appropriate yeah. to uh, to move into that. But when I went into the infantry unit, uh, the lieutenant that was in charge of of the group that I was under was um, an extraordinary guy, and he. Um, taught me map reading all over again. Whatever I learned in school, I forgot. Mm -hmm. He taught me map reading. He taught me how to look at the terrain and how terrain changes. And they didn't teach me this stuff yeah. in school. Um, he taught me how to how to set myself up at night with different um, defenses and artillery rounds. And he just he taught me how to survive. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take him long to do that and because he had he was the he was the CEO of the whole company, so he had 80 to 100 guys that he had to take care of. And I was just one. But he, um, he led us for, for six months. And um, in that six months, we didn't lose one person in our group, in our company. He was the company commander. 
After that six months, he had to go, and, and he had, he rotated, but he did another tour in Vietnam, and he was an aerial observer for his second tour. Uh, that's the guy that rides around in the little Piper Cub and, and picks up, um, directs artillery fire, basically, yeah. from up there, um, and other kinds of fire, but that's what, that's what he did, and then we got a new skipper, um, and by that time, I was what you call a salty Marine, and, and I was leading my group. Um, from there on, from that, that next four, the next four months after he left, it seemed like disaster was right around the corner all the time. And you know, we had finished Operation Allen Brook, and we were on Mameluke Thrust and Dewey Canyon, and we were really we were a good unit that good in that that we could survive and and get our share of kills if that was the criteria for being good. Mm -hmm. um, he, was, he was a great leader, great tactician. Um, and then after he left, um, it, as I said, it deteriorated into um, my final operation was, was Operation Mead River, which was the largest vertical envelopment that, that the Marine Corps had, or any service had ever done. And, what a vertical envelopment is, is where they bring in helicopters and they surround a certain area and they just keep bringing them in and bringing them in until they have all these troops that cordon off mm -hmm. an area and then they close in the area. What we didn't know was that the Vietnamese were underground and killing us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, They didn't have the kind of intelligence that we needed mm -hmm. to pull this operation off. And once we got into the operation, we, we knew it was a slaughter and it was... Um, um, you know, that's, that's kind of when I decided it was time for me to get out of the field because I, I just, I couldn't take it anymore. But the, we went in on waves and on the third wave going in um, was, was my wave. And when I landed, um, there were these Korean Marines that we were working with for this particular operation. And they were running around picking up bodies and, and it was mostly the bodies of of our command post. I mean, the skipper got killed and, and a lot of good guys that they just got killed. And, and it was, um, these were guys that had been around a while too that, that knew how to survive, but they were, they were sitting ducks. They were just, it was just an incredibly stupid operation. And, um, you know, so we went in and we fought hard for a week. Um, but getting back to, to the, um, to the skipper, the original skipper uh, turned out to be uh, the guy who who started Federal Express, Fred Smith. Oh. Um, you know, he's he just had he was just a caliber, the caliber of person that he was. He was just a young guy. He was only in his twenties, and he he was going to come back home and go back to college. And you know, he's just. But he was the most unforgettable guy. And and the reason I say that is 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 twofold. One, he helped me to learn how to survive, and two, that when he left, it all fell apart. Mm. It just, so that you could see the type of person that it took to command an, uh, uh, an infantry group in a, in a situation that was a strictly, uh, you were not gonna win. I mean, it's just, the, the tactical errors that, that our leadership made and that war were just um, just incredible. I mean, I, I've since gone to Framingham State and tried to do a lot of reading about it, and um, time and time again, you find the mistakes that, that we made um, from a practical standpoint in, in, in strategy that, that um, you needed somebody of a superior uh, caliber like, like Fred Smith just to keep you alive, never mind. Mm -hmm. Um, rack up body counts, and that wasn't that wasn't his mission. His mission was to stay alive. Yeah. Um, Do you think that's more true of Vietnam than other wars, based on your readings? That there's you mean body counts? N no, that, uh, that the the poor leadership or the tactical mistakes was a, a greater proportion of them in this war than maybe in other wars. Yeah, I think I think there was a huge lack of intelligence and a huge. Um, um, from my reading, anyway, a huge ego problem with the Joint Chiefs and and um, 
and Robert McNamara and those folks, you know, the best and the brightest, um, were, were um, um, you know, we weren't people to them. We were numbers. And it's, you know, they were, I'm not saying that, that fighting communism was wrong. It wasn't wrong. Fighting communism was the right thing to do. It's just the way they went about it was the wrong way. It's, you know, the Marines, the Marines in World War II taught us a lesson that, that you know, we watch Saving Private Ryan and we see the, the slaughter on the beach there magnify that by 10 times and you've got Guadalcanal and, and you've got the islands with, where the Marines um, um, gave their lives. You know, we should have learned something from that and we didn't. Hopefully we learned something in Vietnam and, and where, you know, um, you know, something like, like Gulf War. Now that was, that's the way you fight a war. You, you win. You, you do it to win. You don't do it to, to um, you know, stabilize the economy or whatever they were doing. I, my humble opinion is they were looking for oil in, in the South China Sea or something. I don't know what, what it was all about. And McNamara will probably take it to his grave with them mm -hmm. because there's still, uh, you know, still stuff that, that uh, is unclassified, I think, as far as uh, the Tonkin Gulf and the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. Um, you know, there's still a lot of stuff that, um, uh, who was it, uh, Fulbright, you know, I think, my personal opinion is is that Fulbright knew where we went wrong on this and, and I think it was Fulbright uh, took the truth to the grave with him, you know. You mentioned uh, Korean uh, Marines. Could you tell me about that and any other nationalities you might have fought with? I, I work with Korean Marines. They 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 were probably you know the f most fearless people I've ever seen as a group. Um, I work with uh, the Dong Ha, which were the Red Berets in Vietnam. Uh, I went out on a few operations with them as a liaison and uh, interpreter. Um, and I work with some Arvin groups, but by the time I got there, most of the uh, most of the Arvin groups that I work with were sissies. You know, they were just they were what was left of a decimated army. Um, I'm sure in the early days that the Arvin uh, army were first class fighters, but by that time they were nothing. They were just uh, sissies. And could you tell me? Tell the you and the audience what Arvin stands for. Uh, the Army of Vietnam, right. of South Vietnam. And the you mentioned the Red Berets. What the Dong Ha. Are they equivalent to our Green Berets? Yeah, in yeah. some in right. some ways, yeah, okay. yeah. Any other? They're different. Yeah, but but in terms of stature. Yeah, and then the Korean Marines right. were were there. Yeah. Any other nationalities? Nope, um, not that 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 I work with. No. No. Any humorous stories that came out of that awful war? You know, I looked at that question and, and I tell you, I wrestled with it and, and I have to tell you this, that um, uh, I couldn't think of one thing funny. I really couldn't. And, and when I look back on what used to make us laugh, it was, it was really black humor and, and really it's not funny. Um, um, so I won't even get into that. I mean, that may not be the, the right answer here, but, you know, I... No, that's, that's a good answer. There's nothing funny about it. Well, you mentioned, we're jumping ahead now, you mentioned uh, there was not much of a reception when you landed in the United mm -hmm. States. When you finally went back to your family and friends, how did they react to you as a returning... My family was terrific. Um, yeah. They welcomed me with open arms and... and um, you know, if it weren't for them, I, you know, I always, I look back on, on uh, my life since I came back, the, the second part, and, and uh, you know, I wonder that, that somebody in that position has like three options, and, and the first option is to, to get drunk and, and do drugs and wind up in the gutter and the second option is to get drunk and do drugs and have your family take care of you. And the third option is just to be straight as an arrow and work like hell and not think about anything else. Yeah. And I think those are the three options that you have. Mm -hmm. 
and I was in the middle, you know. So you um, you went through stuff, so to speak, after you yes. got back from Oh Vietnam. yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I was just um, self-medicating. Right. You know. Were you working at the same time? I had a number of different jobs. Right. I had lots of different jobs. Were you married at that time? No. Okay. Oh, no. So you were living at home or living alone? And living around. Right. Traveling. Yeah. What work were you trying to do at that time? Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I had all kinds of different jobs. Yeah. I wasn't. I didn't have a plan. Yeah. So how long were you continuing that way? How long did that go on? Um, I was. Um, Probably until I was 35 mm. or 36 mm. did I settle down and, and marry my wife and and really decide that, you know, this is this other way of life is, right. you know, not... Uh, but by then I was getting a little help too, you know, from uh, from the VA and, and uh, you know. So it was when I was 35 or 36 I changed. Well, you've done a lot since then. What have you What have you been doing since you were thirty five? Well, uh, when I got married, I I started a business of my own, a, a little breakfast and lunch restaurant with my brother, and from there I decided that I needed to go back to school, and so I went back to school and I got my uh, history degree, and from there I uh, got a job with the state, and you know, just working, just working. I'm on. Three now work like heck, you know. Stay no <laughs> more drugs now. Yeah, no more drugs and alcohol. And just work like heck. That's you know that's the third option. <laughs> what did you? I asked you what you thought when you landed in Vietnam mm -hmm. about the war effort. You said you wanted oh, a drink of water. Right. What do you think now regarding the Vietnam War effort? How do you feel now? Um, so, it was a waste. It was an absolute positive waste of people and money and it was a waste. Did you uh, join the reserves on your no, return? No, I didn't want to have anything to do with, right. with uh, any organizations, particularly military organizations or government organizations. None. But how about the VA benefits? Did you? When I first got home, I was um, diagnosed with, um, I had some ear problems. Mm -hmm. Both the ears were infected and bleeding. I had bursitis on both my knee, mm -hmm. knees and elbows from uh, living in the, in the mud and everything and the, sleeping in the water. And um, So I applied as soon as I got out. In fact, it was Mike Tordai was the, uh, the uh, veterans guy here and he was a good personal friend anyway before I went in. He made me go in and, and file a claim, mm -hmm. although it was the last thing I wanted to do. I went in there and I sat and they made me wait for eight hours. I uh, sat for eight hours and I just threw the papers on the desk and walked out after that and I, I didn't look to the VA for many, many years afterwards when, when I decided that I needed to go back to school and, and get an education. and needed a way to pay for it. So that's when you That's when I went back to the VA. Finally right. took advantage of it. Right. Is there a thought or a memory that you'd like to share with your family or the community or future generations? Well, um, yeah, just uh, war is the ultimate social problem and, and the freedom that we all enjoy is not free. It's, and I'd like to thank my, uh, my family for not giving up on me. Oh, you know? right. Well, I want to thank you so much okay. for coming in here. It was a thank wonderful you. interview. Thank you. Thank you.